right now we're in mine. We got InstaLod open. As far as the InstaLod window goes, what I like to do is go ahead and pull this off and put it on a second monitor and just have this uh, set up available to me. Um, if not, just to kind of keep it on the screen, I'm going to keep it tabbed up in here. But of course, you can still make it as wide as you need to. In order to get this FBX in here, I'm just going to drag it right from Windows right into Maya. Hit Import. And now we've got the object in Maya. There's a couple things we need to talk about, and number one is the actual object size, object size itself. We modeled this from a ZBrush primitive. It comes in a little small. In order to find out exactly how small, let's go to Windows, Settings, Preferences, Preferences. Go to Settings, and you're going to see our working units. We're working in centimeters here. Now we also have a grid, so let's go to Display, Grid, and the Option box. And you're going to see we have a grid, si grid line every five units. So basically, this is five centimeters right here, which means this is about two inches in the United States. So it's a little bit small. You can go ahead and resize this in Maya. In order to look at these objects and stay organized, I'm going to hit this button right here. That's just going to open our outline right here. And you're going to say we have, you're going to see we have all of our objects lined up and named right here, just like we did in ZBrush. Let's go ahead and throw these all in a group. I'm going to select the top one, hold down Shift, select the bottom one, hit Control G. That'll throw it into a group node. You can hit the little plus sign to see all of the objects in there. I'm going to double click this group node, we'll rename it pistol, and with that group node selected I'm going to hit E on my keyboard, I'm sorry, R on my keyboard. I'm just going to scale this up so that it's a little bit more accurate as far as the overall size goes. Of course you don't have to do this, you can go over here and install, I'm going to make it a little bit wider here so we can see all of these tabs right here. If, if it is too short and it's like this, all you got to do is hit these right arrows and you can kind of scroll through here. I want to see all of them. I'm going to go to the Setup tab, and you're going to see there's a Scene Unit Scale. Also in InstaLot, if you hover over any item in the inter interface, it'll go ahead and give you a pop-up of exactly what this accomplishes, or what the function of this particular menu item is. In this case, it's to set the Scene Unit Scale, so that if you're working in a program that has a different unit scale than the one you're working in in Maya, or it does something weird with your scale, you can go ahead and set your Scene Unit Scale to be appropriate in here. I'm going to go ahead and reset this back to 1. And in fact, just to make sure we're completely reset, I'm going to open up this Reset Settings to Default, and just click that. So now InstaLot should be completely re reloaded and completely fresh. And you can see right off the bat, there's a ton of really cool stuff you can do in InstaLot. Optimizing your meshes, remeshing your meshes which we're, is what we're going to be doing today. Uh, doing imposterized meshes, merging materials, occlusion culling, baking, bake output settings, UVs, batch settings. So if you set up a batch profile, of course you can execute that batch on any number of objects or assets. And like I said before, we're going to be covering a bunch of this stuff in the future, but for now we're just going to keep it simple. We're going to go to the Remesh tab, and we're going to have InstaLot again, create a game res and UVs and baker maps for us so we can go ahead and get this into paint or texture it up. And then from there you can throw it into anything you'd like. If you want to do Unreal Engine, you want to do Unity, you just want to render it out, whatever you want to do. Now in here you're going to see there's two modes. We've got Reconstruct and Optimize. Optimize we're going to be covering a little bit later, but for now we're just going to keep this on Reconstruct. To kind of explain this in the best way that I know how, basically if I keep these default settings and I just hit reconstruct my, or uh, remesh my selected meshes, what it would do is create an envelope that will grab all of my surface changes in this object. Basically voxelizing together, or if you're familiar with ZBrush, dynameshing everything together to create one solid envelope for this entire mesh, and then of course UV, bake it, and all that stuff after that. Why that's useful is if you've got an object like this one and it's constructed of hundreds of different parts, and you don't want each one of those parts to get its own separate mesh, which in some cases might be what you want, in this case it's not necessarily what I want. The reconstruct remesh will go ahead and for each one of these objects with the settings I'm going to use, give me one distinct mesh for each object. For example, if I go down here, all of these little buttons in here will go ahead and just that will just be bake detail that will be applied to a single solid object. So if I keep all these options, it's going to bake this all into one object. But like I said before, I want to keep some of these objects separate. So when the animators go and, for example, put a rotation on this trigger for animation purposes, I want this trigger to not be connected to any other object. So as you can see, I have my trigger separate right here. In order to tell the remesher to go ahead and keep these objects separate for me, I'm going to have to turn on this distinct construction right here. So let's go ahead and turn that on. And let's talk about a few more of these options. You see, we already have the reconstruct options selected. We're not going to do optimize this time. And you're also going to see right here, we have fuzzy face count target, maximum triangles, and screen size and pixels. If you know how big the object is going to be in the screen size, you can go ahead and type that in, and it will go ahead and optimize your mesh resolution to be compatible with the number of pixels in the screen. Maximum triangles is pretty self-explanatory. Just type in how many triangles you want for your object. It'll go ahead and stick to that size. I'm not exactly sure how many polygons I'm going to want for this object, but I do know if I go down here to the fuzzy face count target, there's going to be low, lowest, normal, high, and highest. 
basically what we're looking at is normal would be a general resolution for an object for like PC and console for let's say like a general prop. Low would be more for like a mobile game. Lowest would be just for a really insignificant prop that you're not going to see very closely. This particular prop, you know, if you're playing a first person shooter and you've got the gun right at the bottom of your screen, there's a chance it could be seen very large. So I'm going to go ahead and set this to high because we're going to want to throw a lot of polygons at this. The great news is if you pick one of these and it's a little bit higher than you would want, all you got to do is go over here to this optimize tab after the fact, then you can drop down however many LODs you want and optimize from here and it'll go super fast. Now the fuzzy face count target is going to be what determines our poly count. Down here under surface instruction, under resolution, you're going to see resolution is set to normal. Now if this is controlling resolution, what is this resolution controlling? Basically, the lower you set this one, the less detail it's going to capture on the broad surfaces of the object, and the more it's going to just try and maintain just the form, just the basics of how your object is comprised as far as these big shapes right here, and a little less on these small shapes here. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and keep this resolution at normal. And right here for adaptive resolution, we have that checked on because we have distinct surface construction. Basically, what that's going to do is look at the overall size of the bounding box of your entire object, and if you have anything smaller, it's going to give less importance to a smaller object than it will a larger object relative to the overall size of the asset. There's a lot more options in here, and this is stuff we'll be going over in the future, but for now, I'm just going to go ahead and hop down here to where we have UVs. We'll talk about clipping planes in a bit, but for now, let's talk about the unwrap strategy. So it's set to auto right now, which I think defaults to organic. We're going to go ahead and choose hard surface axial. We'll go over the difference between hard surface axial and hard surface angle, but for now, just for hard surfaces, which is most of what this is, we're going to go ahead and choose axial. And when we go to bake this out, we're going to want a little bit of distance in between the shells of our UVs. We're going to go ahead and make sure there is a gutter size. It's set at two. If we bake this out to say a 2048 map, that'll leave two pixels in between shells. In this case, for a first person weapon, that's probably fine since I'm probably not going to be LODing out in that case, but feel free to go ahead and bump this up as needed. You can enable shell stitching right here to stitch some of your shells together to reduce the amount of overall shells that you're going to end up with, and then insert normal splits is basically when you do a hard surface unwrap. In order to get a good bake, you're going to want to split apart the shells or the UVs of those shells if they don't share the same vertex normal. That way in those areas you'll use this gutter size to get a little bit better of a normal bake. Underneath the bake section, it's going to tell you, you need to go set the bake output settings in order to tell these textures where to go when it's done baking. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to scroll back up here. We're going to go to the bake output tab. Let's open the output folder and file name section. We're just going to browse to the output path. I'm just going to throw it in the folder where we have our high res. The file name format, you can see if you scroll down here in this info, you can set it to be whatever, whatever naming convention you'd like. I'm going to go ahead and keep the default for now. Under texture pages here, I'm going to go ahead and set this to 2048. Hit tab and then type in 2048 again. I'm going to go ahead and keep super sampling on, even though it's going to increase our, sam our processing time. I think it's going to give us a slightly better result. The dilation on the bake is how far out, how many pixels out our bake is going to go past our UV shells. Give us a little bit of breathing room, a little bit of bleed. So that if we do LOD this down and drop the texture size, we're not going to get any mipping texture issues. And also looking at their documentation, they did mention that changing this 32 BPP export format to PNG 8 dithered will help reduce banding when you go down to an 8-bit texture or you convert to an 8-bit texture, which will give you a lot nicer, cleaner results when you get to the maps down here. Speaking of the maps down here, we got our tangent space normal. Let's go ahead and bake out our object space normal, ambient occlusion. Custom material textures is something we're not doing this time, so I'm going to go ahead and uncheck that. We'll need a position map. We'll need a vertex color map, which is our material IDs, since we baked them out of, uh, we're exported them out of ZBrush's vertex color. Let's go ahead and throw in a thickness map, a curvature map, and I think we're done. If you scroll down here, you're going to see there's a lot more options in here that you can change. Uh, in fact, let's go down here to tangent space. I lied. If you hover over these, you're going to see uh, binormal per fragment, and if you look down at the lower left-hand side, or you just roll over it, it'll tell you this setting is dependent on how your renderer engine computes the tangent basis. Uh, Unreal Engine is on, Unity is off, Maya is off. If we're going to go to Unreal Engine, we can go ahead and just turn that on. Normalize TS per fragment. Uh, Unreal Engine, you're going to want that off. Unity off, Maya on. Um, let's say we're going to go into Unreal later on, so I'm going to go ahead and leave that off. The output tangent space is going to be OpenGL. I'm going to throw this into Painter after I'm done, so I'm just going to go ahead and keep this as the default. And I think that's it. So let's go back to this Remesh tab. I'm going to click this top group node right here, which contains all of my meshes. I'm just going to hit this Remesh Selected Meshes button, and I'm going to let InstaLog take over from here. All right, that went ahead and finished up for us. As you can see right here, and the output log, it took 158 seconds. Again, this is not an optimized mesh. We're going to be going over best practices in high res and a lot of different ways to kind of optimize and tune and tweak options to get better and faster results. But you can see we took a 22 million 
triangle mesh and got a low res with the UVs with baked maps. Um, you can see every time we run a process on Instalot, it throws out new meshes over here. So what I'm going to do is hit, make sure we have this selected here. So these are all of our new meshes here. I'm going to hit control G to go ahead and group those. And then I'm going to do shift P to unparent those. So I've got my pistol high res here. I'm going to do control H to go ahead and hide that. And now you can see we have our low res here. I'm going to go ahead and hit six in my viewport. So now you can see the material ID is plugged in, the normal map is already on there. So let's go ahead and throw this into Substance Painter. In order to do that, I'm gonna go ahead, select all of my meshes here. And with all of them selected, you can see under the triangle count, we have 10,868 triangles. Let's go over here to File, Export Selection. I'm gonna make a new folder called Painter Instalod. And we'll just go ahead and call this Pistol Low under the FBX. Uh, for the FBX, FBX options under geometry, I'm going to have tangents and binomials checked on, and I think that's it. So let's go ahead and hit export. Let's hop over into Painter here. Let's go to File, New. Go ahead and select Painter Inst Instalod. We'll do the pistol low. Let's go ahead and add our textures here. Go ahead and turn on Compute Tangent Space per Fragment. Our document resolution, we're going to go ahead and bump that up to 2048. Hit OK. And here you can see we have our low res mesh. Go over to texture settings tab over here. And we're also going to go to the textures tab over here. And let's go ahead and throw our textures where they're supposed to be. For the normal map, I'm going to go ahead and say, here's my normal. And just with the normal map applied, you can see we're getting really, really good results. Very, very clean. And if you didn't want to bake some of this stuff, I'm going to go ahead and do another video uh, in the future where we go ahead and simplify these with translucency meshes and occlusion meshes and clipping planes, all sorts of really cool stuff you can do to control your final mesh. But for a one button solution, it's a really, really nice result. Go ahead and start over here from the left. So here's the ambient occlusion file. Here's our ID map. Our curvature. This is our object normal. We're going to go ahead and throw that in the world space normal. Here's our position map. And finally, our thickness map. Check that out. I just wanted to take you guys through the really cool, really fun, really fast uh, Instalod process. And like I said before, there's a lot of different options in there. So we'll be covering those in future videos as we go along.